Commissioner, I apologise for that confusion before. <laughs> Somebody on behalf of ComBank is going to call the witness. Yes, Ho hopefully I'll get his name right, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I call Peter Nathaniel Clark. Clark. Mr. Clark, can I ask you whether you would prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation. Thank you. Confirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Do sit down. Mr. Clark, your full name is Peter Nathaniel Clark. That's correct. And your business address is 201 Sussex Street, Sydney? Yes. And you are the Chief Credit Officer of Commonwealth Bank of Australia? That's correct. You have received a summons to appear before this commission? I have. Um, I tender the summons, Commissioner. Uh, 3.100, summons to Mr Clark. Please, the Commission. Um, Mr Clark, uh, you have made two witness statements in relation to this commission? That's correct. Um, if I deal with them, I'll deal firstly with the uh, statement which is in relation to the Bank West Mr Weller case study or rubric 3.28. You have made a witness statement dated 27 May 2018. That's correct. Um, and are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. I tender that statement together with its exhibits. A statement and exhibits, uh, Mr Clark. Uh, dated 27 May 18, relating to rubric 3.28, exhibit 3.101. Um, Commissioner, I've just been, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. It's actually 3.24, not 3.28. I do apologise. 3.20, rubric 3-24, thank you. Um, and Mr Clark, you have made a uh, another statement in the matter, rubric 3.25, in the matter of the Bank West Mr Doherty case study. That's correct. Uh, and you have a copy of both those statements with you in the witness box? I do. Is the contents of that statement true and correct? It is. I tender that statement together with, with its exhibits. Statement of Mr Clark and its exhibits relating to rubric 3-25 is exhibit 3.102. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr <laughs> Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Mr Clark. My name's Albert Denali. I'm one of the counsel assisting the commission. And I'd like to ask you a few questions this morning about the case studies of Mr Stephen Waller and Mr Michael Doherty. Good. Um, have you been uh, in the hearing room to hear their evidence, Mr Clark? I have. Um, and am I right that you are the Chief Credit Officer of the Commonwealth Bank? That's correct. Uh, and you've been in that role since um, March 2014. That's right. And in that role, you're responsible for the credit management of facilities that have been classified as troublesome or impaired assets. That's correct. And you're also, in that role, you're responsible for a, for a group within the bank called Group Credit Structuring. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and am I right that um, Group credit structuring uh, some time ago um, merged with or CAM, credit asset management of Bank West, became part of that, is that right? That's right. Um, and uh, in your statements, you've given evidence in response to the circumstances, in your two separate statements. One, you've given evidence in response to um, Mr Weller's uh, then outline of evidence and uh, and Mr Doherty, is that right? That's right. Um, and did you have any personal involvement in either of their cases at the relevant time, Mr Clark? Uh, in Mr Weller's case, I'm not aware of any personal involvement at all. In Mr Doherty's case, I think subsequent to the receiver's um, role, I think I had one or two emails in the final write-off from the losses uh, right at the end, but that was the extent of... My I see, and we'll, we'll come to that and I might ask you some Just questions. Just ask you to keep your voice up a bit, Mr Clark, if you wouldn't mind. Certainly. Thank you. So aside from those matters, which we might touch on, aside from those matters, your evidence in, uh, in respect of both these former Bankwest uh, customers is based on your review of 
um, of the relevant material, is that right? That's right. Uh, and discussions you've had with other people? Uh, yes, discussions with people within Bank West and CBA. Thank you. Perhaps I can start by, uh, by taking you to um, Mr Weller's evidence. You heard evidence yesterday <clears throat> in relation to his business facility through a company known as Bainbridge Enterprises, number one, P Proprietary Limited? That's right. Uh, and that um, was the vehicle through which initially with a business partner, uh, and later uh, just he and his wife purchased the Nambucca Hotel? That's correct. Uh, and that facility was initially entered into in 2005, is that right? That's right. And it was extended, sorry, it was um, increased, that is the, the level of the facility was increased in 2008, so as amongst other things, Mr Weller could buy out his business partner? I think that was the sole purpose for the increase, but yes. Uh, and at that point, uh, the facility totaled $3.725 uh, million? I think that's right. Can I ask? that the facility itself be brought up, CBA.4000.0074.7.2.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
I think from what I understand of Bank West, it probably wasn't that unusual for Bank West. In my banking experience, it's perhaps a little more unusual. Um, why is that? Why is it um, perhaps more unusual? Um, I think, you know, longer term, 30 years are for home loans. Um, project finance type transactions where it might take a long time for repayment could be 10, 15 uh, years. Commercial transactions normally uh, beyond five years is fairly rare in my experience. I see. And um, can I explore some other parts of this document with you briefly? If one goes to the, um, to the next page, there is, um, so it's seven, sorry, 7959. You'll see, <coughs> um, which again I imagine is, is um, the case with all such documents, there's a reference to the securities um, and there was security over the, the hotel itself as well as assets, uh, as, as well as a fixed and floating charge. Do you see that? That's right. Yes. And that included. Um, all assets and undertaking, including liquor and gaming licences. We'll come yes. to this later, but that included the poking machines, for example, that were being operated at the Nambucca Hotel. Yeah, I think all the assets of that company were designed to be incorporated in that security. I see. Um, there was... It, it, Mr Weller didn't give his, his home as security, did he? No, he didn't. For this facility. Um, and there are... Um, what I described at 6.5 at the bottom, financial undertakings. Do you see that? I do. And if one goes over the page, um, and you would have heard Mr Weller give evidence about these, uh, these covenants yesterday, um, perhaps at the top, if that can be um, increased, there's the in interest cover ratio and the debt service ratio. Um, what is what is an interest cover ratio? <coughs> um, so that's a, a ratio that attempts to measure uh, the cash flow surplus above the interest obligations of a borrower. So in this case, they're using EBITDA, which is earnings before interest and tax and amortisation of a borrower. So it's a proxy for pre-debt servicing cash flow divided by interest, so an ICR above two times suggests the business generates two times as much cash as is required for interest payments. I uh, see. And what's the purpose of that covenant from the bank's perspective? Um, I think it's part of prudent management by the bank um, of the credit exposure that it's, uh, that it's written. It, it sort of allows it to um, compare the performance of the business to the forecasts and the expectations. I think it also uh, is useful from a borrower's perspective as to how he's tracking. If his ratio is performing above that level, uh, he can feel comfortable, I think, in the, how his business is actually operating. Uh, and then the debt service ratio, can you explain that? Uh, so Mr. that's Clark? similar. The, the uh, numerators I think it should be CFADS, not CAFDS. I think that's a typo. But CFADS is cash flow available for debt service, which generally takes EBITDA, um, adjusts for um, working capital um, movements as well to try and EBITDA is more an accounting construct. Um, CFADS is more a cash flow, uh, attempt to um, more accurately measure cash flow. So CFADS is used as a proxy in that sense uh, from, from EBITDA, and divided by total debt service, which includes interest plus scheduled principal payment. So that's the entirety of the debt service obligations of a borrower over the period of time that we're talking about. Uh, and does it have a similar purpose to the purpose of the interest cover ratio? Yeah, so it's, uh, it includes the total debt service obviously is a higher number because it would include many scheduled principal payments, so that's why the ratio is, is slightly lower. Uh, and <coughs> Excuse me. And each of them have a requirement of two. Well, in this case, respectively, two times and one point five times. Um, are those ratios um, set, or are they worked out on a case by case basis? In your experience, uh, I think 
the answer is probably both um, to those. So I think uh, in some particular industries there may be a policy around requiring particular covenants and particular level of covenants. Um, in others there may not be those requirements, but I would suggest that prudent banking would suggest these are probably a good idea to have, have these type of financial covenants. Um, and in fact, um, uh, well, are they part of business loans currently offered by CBA? Yes. Uh, and essentially your evidence as to their purpose is essentially it gives a, um, it evidences the, the, the health of the business um, and relevantly the ability to pay off <coughs> the relevant facilities. That's correct. Um, and if you breach one of, if one breaches one of these, that's a, a breach of the facility. In this case, yes. Um, uh, in the same way that if um, you fail to meet a payment, that's a, fail to meet an interest payment or an interest and principal re repayment, that too is a um, breach? Um, they are both breaches. I think the um, importance of the two probably would be treated differently by a bank, but they are both breaches, General. Why would they be treated differently by the bank? Um, so I think failure to meet a payment of interest or a scheduled payment of principal or failure to meet um, the amount owing at the expiry of a loan I think is seen as a fundamental breach of the terms of the contract. Um, the financial covenants we just talked about, ICR and DSCR or DSR, um, are more indicative of the financial performance. I think they're seen as guidelines. They may, uh, legally may well be breaches of the loan contract, but I think um, it's very rare in my experience for a bank to actually call a default and demand repayment as a result of a breach of one of these ratios alone. Um, and you're aware that during the time that Mr Weller, um, uh, Mr. Weller had his facilities with with the bank, um, he, he did indeed breach um, the ICR and or DSR um, ratios on a number of occasions? Um, yes, I did see that. Um, and you're also aware, however, that he ne never breached any of the repayments that were owing during um, the course of the facilities? Um, well, I'm not sure that's actually correct, Mr Denali. Well, I think there were significant payment breaches at the back end of well, these facilities. That was after the period that um, the uh, that uh, the bank um, said that the facilities though had expired, hadn't they? Um, I'm trying to recall the particular timing of when the breaches first occurred, but I think in. Uh, um, Maybe confusing it with the other case, Mr. Denali. Uh, so you um, you wouldn't be the first to do that, <coughs> Mr. Clark. Rest assured. Um, but but, but you know, my, from memory, um, there were significant um, financial um, breaches, arrears, non-payments by Mr. Weller. Um, but let, let's be clear about that, just so we can place it. But those financial breaches um, occurred as I understand the bank's position, occurred on the non-repayment of the entirety of the loan at the end of the facility? Um, I think that is true, but I, from memory, I think there were also something in the order of 226,000 of arrears at the time receivers were appointed in this uh, matter. Uh, that's that, in addition to the non-payment of the principal. That is that is correct, and that's the subject of your evidence. but. Those arrears arose, just to be clear, after, maybe I'll place it for you, the deed of forbearance um, which was entered into between the bank and Mr Weller, which is part of your evidence and also was uh, exhibited to Mr Weller's uh, statement, was entered into in January 2013. That's correct. Um, and the $226,000 of arrears to which you refer when the uh, receivers were appointed were as a result of breaches, or, sorry, I withdraw that, were as a result of um, payments being failed to be made after that date. Um, you've jogged my memory, Mr Donnelly. So I think the facility expired around the 10th of January. It did, 2013. And so those breaches were after that time. That's correct. So, right. so to return to the initial question, 
during the course of the existence of the facilities, and they changed in time, and obviously I'm going to ask you some questions about the length of the facility in a moment, but during the course of the facility from this date until January 2013, that is immediately before its expiry, there were no um, monetary defaults on the loan? I think that's correct, yes. Um, and in fairness, as you've said, you, you did say, however, um, you answered affirmatively that there were a number of non-monetary defaults. After that time. Sorry, the non-monetary defaults happened during the course of the facilities. Non-monetary defaults? That's right. Yes. Um, but no monetary defaults? That's correct. Just one final question about the facility itself. It didn't have an LVR covenant. Um, that's right, isn't it? I think that's correct. Um, and in your experience, was this something that was... Uh, typically not included in Bankwest facility agreements? Uh, well, this was 13 or 14 years ago. I'm not sure I can really speak sensibly to that question. I'm surprised there was no LVR, but that's from my current knowledge, not from knowledge. Why were you surprised, using your current knowledge? I think lending to a pub um, um, with this amount of leverage, I would have thought an LVR covenant would be a sensible covenant to have from a bank's perspective. And in fact, that would be the policy of CBA now? Um, I'm not sure it's policy. I think it's good banking practice, if I can put it that way. It may well be policy, but it's certainly some good banking practice. Now, what I'd like to take you to is in 2010, there was a negotiation with Mr Waller about the terms of the um, facility. Do you recall that from your review of the materials? Uh, yes. Uh, and there was to be a, a variation of the facility? That's right. And in, to this time, the, the facility was... So in 2010, on the basis of your evidence that the initial drawdown was made around June 2008, uh, there were still 13 years to run on the facility? I think that's correct. Before we go on, I might just provide some um, background. Around this time, in the background, was off, there was Project Magellan was um, occurring. Is that right? I understand so, yes. Now, I know you weren't involved in um, Project Magellan, but you've, you're aware of its existence? Yes. And we'll ask more questions of your colleague, Mr Cohen, about how that project worked and what it set out to achieve, but relevantly for the purposes of Mr Waller, was, are you aware whether the Bainbridge facility was, uh, was the subject of Project Magellan? Uh, I understand it was reviewed as part of uh, Magellan, yes. Uh, and <clears throat> do you know what basis it was chosen as one of the facilities to review? Uh, not specifically, other than I think um, pubs, hotels generally were part of that review above a certain amount of exposure, um, but why specifically it was identified, I'm not aware, but I'm not surprised it was part of that. And are you aware what assessment was given to Mr, um, Mr. Weller's Nambucca Hotel by, the, uh, by Project Magellan? I am. Um, and in fact, it was recorded, was it not, in the document to which I'll take you, PNC 48, which is CBA.4000.0029.89.4. What's this document, Mr Clark? It appears to be the Project Magellan review of Bainbridge and Nambaka Hotel. And if one goes to the second page, um, I think it's Mr Goldsmith who was then Mr um, Weller's 
a business relationship manager, he um, said the account conduct has been satisfactory and information provided in a timely manner. Um, and skipping that next sentence, we have a good relationship with the client. Um, and of course, he hadn't been in any monetary defaults at this time. If one goes to the next page, sorry, that was it. Just confirming that, of course, he hadn't been in any monetary defaults as at the time of Project Magellan. I think that's, that's true. Um, and if then there was the, the review panel, sorry, the review that in this case was done by Ferrier Hodgson. If one goes to the second page of that, Um, there's some conclusions um, under the heading recommendation summary. Do you see that? I do. And it says the hotel appears to generate stable earnings which is sufficient to service debt and scheduled principal repayments. Do you see that? I do. Uh, and then security value in relative terms is holding. Uh, and then there's a reference here to um, fixed interest rate ends in June 2010. Just recalling what we discussed previously, I think Mr Weller had a interest, um, a, a, um, a period where it was interest only, didn't he, for two years? Uh, that's correct, yes. And, um, and just to deal with the outcome of Project Magellan, um, it was green. What did green mean at the time for Project Magellan? Um. Well, I assume it means no issues, no problems, it passes. I think I've seen others in my extensive experience of two Magellan files that I've looked at and yes. was uh, a different colour. So I think green indicates pass. Well, and you'll, and you'll see in relation to Mr Doherty, reference to double red and we'll That's come right. to that. Uh, Can I, sorry, Mr Donnelly, just the comment about the fixed interest rate yes. ends, I think, just to be clear, I think... Um, Mr Weller had split the facility, so he had the ability to actually have part floating, part fixed. So I think that's what that's referring to. Oh, that the the thank you for that interest rate ends in, June in, in fact, it might be that fairly I should have um, taken you to where it says future action right down the bottom. The second dot point, ensure amortisation commences in June 2010. That's a reference to the fact that there's got to be some principal payments. That's right. The fixed interest rates are a slightly different issue. Yes, correct. And that was my fault. I apologise. So at least at that time when Magellan was done, the hotel did not need to be transferred to CAM, to credit and asset management, by reason of um, Project Magellan. Uh, that's correct. Um, now, Bank West made an offer to Mr Weller to extend the Bainbridge facility in August 2010. You're aware of that? Uh, that sounds about right. Okay, well, it might assist you, and obviously we're talking uh, about some time ago and also matters of which you don't have personal knowledge. But if I can take you to PNC 51... CBA.0001.0318.1 What's this document, um, Mr. Mr. Clark? Well, it appears to be exactly as headed, credit risk of facility amendment, so that's a paper from the relationship team to credit normally for approval of a, some amendments. I see. And, um, and what, um, um, when was this um, document um, produced? I think, Mr Donnelly, I might need a little more help to answer that question. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be on the face of the document, unless no. it's and in, in, in your, the body of it. In your statement, you say, if you'll bear with me, 
July 2010. So just to place this, this is about to be the period after, uh, it's about two years into the facility. Mm. And this was prepared by, if I understand it correctly, um, the business relationship man manager, Mr Goldsmith, in light of the forthcoming expiry of the 24 month interest only period, uh, a suggestion or a, a recommendation was put um, in the form of this, um, in the form of this document, the credit risk facility agreement. Who would this go to, Mr. Clark? Um, so without being cute about it, I mean this is one front page of a document that I can't see a date on. But assuming it, it, it's date, it's date according to your statement, it's dated the 16th of July 2010. Um, but as I said, I think before this would this would normally be produced by the relationship manager for yes. the relationship and put to credit for approval. I see, uh, and it uh, would contain a suggestion by. Uh, I'm speaking generally now. A suggestion from the relationship manager to credit as to what should occur with the facility going forward. That's correct. So if so, if one goes to Point one nine eight three um, under approval for restructuring facilities due to upcoming expiry of fixed rate portion of the Flexi Protect product. Do you see that? I do. Uh, and the author says in the paragraph the th um, underneath the dot points the original approval. Perhaps that can be blown up those two paragraphs if that's not inconvenient. The original approval allowed for a 15 year term in total with the first two years um, IO, which is a reference to it being interest only. Interest only. Thank you. Um, as noted in previous papers, amort uh, amortisation is due to now commence for this facility. Um, the amortisation is seen as crucial as the valuation completed in August 2009 came in at 4.53 million, meaning that the LVR is 82.22%. And then there's reference, although Project Magellan has decreased this amount to 4.3 million, meaning the LVR should be 86.6. .6. Do you know what is meant there by Project Magellan decreasing the valuation? Yes, I think if we... Um went back to the Project Magellan um, pages you had up, I think somewhere in that there is a comment from the reviewer that they thought the valuation that we held was probably a bit high and that it should be the 4.3 figure, I think, was mentioned in that Project Magellan paper. I see. And then if one goes to, uh, or if we can pick up the next um, two paragraphs, starting with bold borrower. So then this, uh, the, well, this is preceded by, we seek business credit approval for the Flexi Protect facility to be closed and our TAE to be restructured as follows. Now, then there's a reference to um, the facility, the size of the facility, and that the term be 13 years. Do you see that? I see that. Um, and, um, and a reference to the commercial advance um, product rate being used plus a margin of 2.74%. Do you see that? I do. And then a, a bullet payment. What's a bullet payment, Mr Clark? Um, so that's when a facility doesn't fully amortise over its term and there is an amount left at the end. So an interest only five year loan of $100 would have a bullet payment of 100 at the end, effectively yes. the same amount. A, a facility that amortised you know, to half over its term would have a bullet payment of half the amount left at the end. So that's what the bullet refers to. Uh, and. <clears throat> there was a realisation then um, by both the bank and by the, the client, by Mr Weller, um, that, or at least perhaps I can quote what's said in the paragraph preceding that, our client Stephen Weller believes, and we agree, that 
they, being the owners, would not be able to service this facility without placing undue pressure on the business, thereby affecting both our serviceability and security position. So that was a relevant factor in deciding what would be the appropriate facility going forward. Yeah, I think to put it in some context, if I could, um, this facility originated at a smaller amount in 2005 as a two-year interest only with 13-year repayments. We are now, I think, in 2009 or 2010, there's been no principal payments over that period of time. So effectively it's grown and that interest only period has been extended and rolled. Um, at origination, the fully, fully amortising was going to be about 30,000 per month uh, on the original facility. The calculation in this document, I think, is something in the order of 39,000, I think, from memory. That's right. Um, per month. So, you know, higher um, than it was back in 2005 was the estimation, um, but the facility is larger. Um, but Mr Weller is not comfortable and the business agrees, I think, that that's too much for him to pay to fully amortise. So that's why this bullet structure was proposed to accommodate that. Now that, that wasn't put to, that offer that um, was discussed here um, wasn't actually put to uh, Mr Weller, was it? Uh, I'm not sure whether that was actually put to Mr Weller. I think there were a series of there negotiations were. and counter-proposals and t comings and goings, if you like, before a final agreement was reached. In, in fact, if I can take you to the next document, C, um, PNC 52, CBA.4000.0075.1407, This is a further submission, which seems to have um, made by Mr Goldsmith, is that right? This looks like an approval paper, I think. Well, this is only a two-page document, and, just, and I was going to ask you about it and how it fit with what was in the previous document. If one goes to the next page, um, and you'll see on the fourth dot point down, max term five years, you see that? I see that. Um, do, are you aware as to why the term that had been suggested in the previous document of 13 years was now being suggested to be five years? I don't, I don't know. Uh, and then if one goes to the next um, document, PNC 53, uh, see, um, which has just come up, you'll see that there's an email from um, a, a, um, from a Mr Greentree to Gary Goldsmith, who is the person who put in those submissions. And the main paragraph there says, as discussed yesterday, may you please approve the change in term from five years to two years for the proposed CADV um, so this suggests that the term was being then approved down from five years to two years. Do you see that? I do see that. Do you yes. know why that change was being made? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, as I said in response to an earlier question, there was lots of toing and froing conversation with Mr Weller. I don't know whether this was in response to that or, or not. Look, there were discussions with Mr Weller, but... Just to be clear, though, at this point there hadn't been an, any, anything put to Mr Weller yet. Are you aware of that? Um, not specifically in terms of the timing of when that happened. Well, Mr. The I... first offer that Mr Weller received, which is the one upon which he gave evidence, which you heard that he was unhappy about the length of the term, was sent on the 4th of August 2010. My question to you is, uh, and it might be that you cannot assist, but why it appears that the documents internally within Bank West, except the 13 years, which was still to run, then it became five years and then it became two years. Are you able to assist as to why that occurred? So I think I responded on the five-year one. I'm, I don't know. Yes. On the five to two, 
Um, again, I don't know unless there had been communication with Mr Weller around that change. And I, I think... I don't know if that was the case or not. Well, his, ev uh, his evidence where the discussions occurred, I think, will become apparent now. Uh, I don't know. He didn't give evidence as to exactly in July what discussions... And, and they may uh, well have been subsequent to this date. I, I, I so the offer that was made on the 4th of August, which is the next document, PNC 54... You've seen this document before. This is PNC in preparing your statement, of course. This is the, the, the variation that was sent. And if you go to the second page, one sees that the facility expiry date there is 24 months from the initial drawdown date. Do you see that? I do. Now, you heard then the evidence of Mr Weller yesterday about the discussions that occurred. And I won't take you to the emails unless you'd like me to, but there was discussion then in emails between him and Mr Goldsmith about why, um, why there was... Um, why the period had been shortened from 15 years to two years. Do you recall that... Um, do you recall the, those emails that Mr Weller referred to? Um, well, I have a general understanding of that conversation and those, that communication. I mean, I can take you to them if you wish, but you have them in your statement. Yeah. And in essence, I think it's fair to say that um, Mr Weller said the original documents noted the expiry of 8 June 2023 and inquired why that wasn't the case. Uh, and then <coughs> um, there was a, some email correspondence about that. And presumably what then occurred is that Mr... Uh, Mr Goldsmith prepared this document, which is PNC 57. Now, this is a Bank West credit risk form. Do you see that? I do. And um, if you go to the second page... Um, under the heading margin, it says the current margin for the client is 2.24%. You'll recall that figure is the figure um, from the facility, which is the margin. And there's a reference in our letter of variation, this was increased to 3.19. In our discussion, the client asked we consider a margin of 3%. Now, I didn't take you those emails, but that was part of that email mm -hmm. correspondence as well. <coughs> Um, however, to do this, it is not possible to meet clients' requirements for the original loan term to be detailed in the new LOV. And then there's reference to the attachment. But can I take you to the next page where, having set out um, consideration of Mr Weller's position, it says, consequently, in order to strike a balance between what the client has requested and believes is affordable and what we require by way of debt reduction, I propose we structure our TAE as follows. And you see there that the reference is to have to reinstall the 12 years, nine months terms. Do you see that? I do. Uh, but if that be the case, then the relevant margin is going to be 3.95%. Do you see that? I do. And then that met with... Um, that met with some concern. You heard the evidence that Mr Weller gave about that. Um, sorry, I should say that was sent then in the form of a, a letter of variation on the 19th of October and that met with some concern from Mr Weller because of the very high margin that was to be imposed. Do you recall that evidence? I do. So then the next stage, and this is obviously what is happening then in, in terms of the next iteration, is Mr Goldsmith goes back to the same body by way of a further version of this document or a, a further update, PNC 60. Um, and if you go then to the second page of that, <coughs> 
and under the heading term of facility. As noted previously, client wanted to have the original term reiterated in the new LOV. Despite my advice that due to LFTP considerations, what's that again, Mr. Clark? Um, uh, again, it's a, a slight typo, so it's LTFP uh, is what it should be, which is long-term funding premium. Um, considerations, the pricing would increase the client was adamant on this point. However, following production of the letter, he now understands more fully the effect of the, I think you would say it's LF, LTFP, 2% yeah. for 10 years as opposed to 0% for one year, and as requested, we amend the term um, from one year to 1 December 2012. Do you see that? 2010, yes, I do. And then there's a reference in the next paragraph to given our preference for facilities over a short term and our desire to review performance of the hotel in 12 months to increase both payments and step-up ratios, I see that a 12-month term is a perfect fit and will be a benefit to BWA and consequently recommend approval. You see that? I do. Where there's a reference to our preference for facilities over a shorter term, what does that mean? Uh, I think that's just a general banking comment that longer tenor um, comes with longer risk. And so bankers always prefer shorter tenors if, if possible. Um, and um, why is that? Well, I think the longer the term of the commitment you make to a client, um, the higher the risk involved, because over time, more things can happen, more things can go wrong, and so shorter tenors um, associated with, you know, there is risk associated with longer tenor, and so bankers prefer shorter tenors. Um, there's less risk involved. Uh, and you'd accept, though, wouldn't you, that from a, a borrower's point of view, um, factors might militate in favour of having a longer term um, facility as well? There are some conflicting views between um, borrowers and, and, and bankers, yes. And, and well, Mr Weller certainly um, would have preferred a longer term, wouldn't he? Um, well, we offered a longer term to Mr Weller, um, which he said he, he, he want, and so we, we made that offer to him. But you know, the long-term funding premium associated with that made the pricing unattractive to him, and he, in the end, uh, I think was preferred to go with that one-year tenor uh, with a lower pricing. Can I take you ahead to May 2012? <coughs> um, oh, perhaps before I do, I'll take you to a, a further update from 2010, just to in, um, which is PNC-64. Before I come to this document, and one of the other things about a shorter term is, of course, it also increases um, uh, it increases the ability of the the bank to exit um, a facility if it doesn't wish to be um, lend any longer. Is that correct? That's true. Um, and that um, was not an irrelevant consideration um, at the relevant time within Bank West. Uh, I'm not sure that was particularly more relevant at that point in time. As I said before, I think generally for banking, shorter tenor is lower risk, and so banks always prefer shorter tenor. Now, well, one of the issues that was raised by Project Magellan, of course, was um, decreasing um, uh, exposure to, um, to this type of lending, wasn't it? Well, I can't really comment on Project Magellan in, in the broad theme. I mean... This, this particular, Mr Weller was passed green by the Project, Mello, uh, Project Magellan Review, so. Um, what I'm asking you though about is in the bank generally, and it's not, um, it may demonstrate that, um, it, that um, and, and if you can't assist me with Project Magellan, that's fine, but within, um, is it fair to say that around 2010 there was a, um, a desire on the part of the bank to um, look very carefully at its business loan book um, and carefully manage um, its exposure? Uh, I think it's common knowledge within the bank and banking generally that post 
GFC, there were concerns about property books of all banks, and Bankwest, you know, was heavily uh, invested in property. So I think there were concerns about the exposures generally. Thank you. And if I go to the second page of this document, what time is it, Anna? Um, there's a number of dot points um, that are referred to. Um, well, there's a reference to, whilst we acknowledge that the performance of the hotel has declined, we believe the client does not belong on, belong on a weak list. Our reasons for this are, and can I just deal with those? The first is that the decline is in line with the industry. You heard Mr Weller's evidence about that, and you'd agree, would you not, that around this time there was less consumer spending as a result of, amongst other things, the GFC? Uh, yes. Um, and the facilities due for... Um, amortisation and term for facilities is 12 months, so any exit could be looked at then. Do you see that? I do. Um, and if it hadn't had it been still a 15-year loan, of course, that, um, that would not have been available in the same way. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and there's reference to client having... The client has a first-class servicing record to date with BWA. Do you see that? I do. Management position considered very strong and client has a good record with regards to provision of information in a timely manner. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you'd have no reason to doubt those, those statements, would you? I don't. Um, now, in 2000, and if I jump ahead, as I said I would, to May 2012, the file was transferred to CAM. Are you aware of that? I am. Um, and in fact, part of your evidence at PNC 96 is uh, and what's called an inward transfer credit paper. Do you see that? I do. Are you familiar with such a document? I am, yes. You would... Uh, did you... Um, have you... Did you see the evidence of your colleague, Mr Perry, um, earlier this week? Um, it, it matters not, but he gave some evidence about this. I, I um, heard briefly Mr. Mr. Perry's evidence. I haven't seen the totality of it. So. Uh, well, he gave some evidence about this, but I'm right to say, am I not, that an inward transfer credit paper is when um, the file is transferred to, um, to credit and asset management? That's true. Um, and if one goes to point zero three five seven, um, the reason for impairment, it says the only shortcomings we can see are as follows, decline in trade of the hotel, and this would have an effect on the valuation of the hotel. Do you see that? I do. Whose handwriting is that there to the right? Do you know? I have no idea. Uh, there's no reference. Um, there's no reference to the fact that Mr. Weller wasn't able to pay um, at that time all his um, interest and principal repayments as they fell due. Uh, if the question, and I'm not sure it was, but if the question was, um, had he been unable to make any payments, I think we've we've agreed that that wasn't the case. He had made all his payments. If the question was, you know, was there an increased uh, concern about his future ability to do that, I'd look at the last column in this document, where EBITDA at 286 is getting very close to the actual level of interest payments, and so I think there would be a concern about the ongoing ability to meet his payments. And in fairness, the person in, in handwriting said, what about decline in trades effect on ability to repay loan? Is, there might have been some concern about what might occur in future, is that right? Yeah. Now, you heard evidence from Mr Weller that... Sorry, just, Mr Donnelly, sorry, just to be clear about that, the decline appears to have happened, not to an extent already where he couldn't meet his payments, but the decline in trade had already occurred. This wasn't a future forecast, it was. It seemed to have actually started to deteriorate over a period of time. I see. 
Now, one of the things that was done at around this time was um, obtaining a valuation for the Nambucca Hotel. Were you aware of that? I am. Um, and Mr. Um, and Mr. Weller was asked to pay for that, wasn't he? He was. Um, and you've heard his evidence that he wasn't shown that valuation at the time? That's true. Um, and you'd agree, would you not, that valuations would have been carried out on many files, including Mr. Weller's, and we'll come to Mr. Doherty shortly, um, at or around the time that they're transferred into CAM? That's probably true, yes. Um, well, and also they'd be um, undertaken by way of the file review process, the general file review process, um, even uh, if they're not in CAM. Um, so that generally doesn't necessarily dictate the need for evaluation, so I think I'd just be a little bit reluctant. Sorry, my point is, I'm not trying to trick you in that regard, my point was simply that valuations were commonly carried out on many files when they were transferred into CAM, which is... That's agree. true. And I said, but they could also be um, obtained at other times, including as part of a file review process. That's right. And you'd, you'd agree that significant decisions were made about Mr Weller's um, facility on the basis of that valuation? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by My that. My question is... As you know, um, uh, as you know, the facility wasn't um, renewed, and one of the reasons that was given for that was that there was a uh, a breach of the LVR covenant. Is that right? I think there were probably a number of reasons the the facility was not not uh, renewed. I think um, the breach of the LVR covenant. Um, you know, I think as we've talked about through the history of Mr Weller's relationship, he breached many of those financial covenants along the way. They were never used as a termination event, and I think they weren't in this case either, but that the breach of the LVR indicated, you know, LVR was very high, and that was a, one of the reasons why we didn't want to renew the loan, but there were other reasons as well. Uh, but the valuation... You'd accept, though, the valuation was a relevant factor in making those decisions on behalf of the bank? It was part of the decision process, yes. Now, in your statement, you say that it's no longer the policy of CBA to, um, to withhold valuations from a, uh, uh, from a customer who has paid for the valuation? That's true. Um, and... Um, that policy, if it were, in, if it had been in place at the time, would have uh, would have been um, breached by what occurred in this case to Mr. Weller. That's right. There was not the same policy didn't exist at that point in time. Um, this has also been an issue that. Um, um, has been the subject of um, regulatory reform as well. Are you aware of changes that are proposed to be made to the banking code? Uh, I am. Um, and one of the concerns that's raised is if significant decisions are made in relation to customers without them seeing valuations, there's a lack of transparency. Would you agree with that? I would. And... Uh, and The, and perhaps I can call up the, um, the code, which, uh, sorry, the proposed final version of the code. We heard some evidence about this from Mr. Koury last week. Um, WIT.0900.0003.029001. I mean, if I could take. So perhaps if I can take, um, introduce this, this is the document that has been the subject of, is, no, is not presently in, in force. It's been provided to ASIC for the purposes of being approved and will become in due course, um, subject to its approval, the, um, the new banking code of practice. That's correct. 
Um, if you go to page 18 of that document, I think it's uh, 18, please, which is chapter 24, um, you see here that there's a reference to our processes in relation to external expert valuations will be fair and transparent. Do you see that? Uh, At 88. I do. Um, and at paragraph 90, we will provide copies of property valuations and valuer instructions, open brackets, except where enforcement proceedings has already been com commenced. Do you see that? I do. Um, there were no enforcement proceedings in... Now, I'm obviously asking you about this, Mr Clark. I'm not saying this was in place. It's not even in place now. And in fact, what I'm going to say is that even if amended in this form, it wouldn't apply to Mr Weller because his borrowings were over $3 million. I, I think CBA's policy, irrespective of that, would be... Uh, now, going forward now, we would still provide the valuation to him. Um, and, and that would be on the basis that the sort of concerns about transparency to, um, would apply to people like Mr Weller just as much to people under $3 million. Just seems a fair thing to do. Um, and you'd accept, and you know, we haven't got uh, to Mr Doherty's circumstances yet, but you'd, you'd accept that um, that would have... Um, would be a fair thing to have done in his case too. Yes. Um, a deed of forbearance was entered into in... Thank you. We no longer need that document. Um, a deed of forbearance was entered into... Um, in January 2013, you'll recall? That's right. Um, uh, and I'm asking, in your experience, is it common for, um, is it common for steps like that to be taken in a period, you know, six or seven months after a file has gone into CAM or now GS? See? Um, I'm not sure I'd use the word common. It, it's not uncommon, is probably how I'd respond to it. I'm indeed a forbearance. Um, I think in this case we didn't want to extend the loan itself, but we also didn't want to take enforcement action. So a deed of forbearance was both for our benefit and for the client's benefit to um, codify, if you like, the agreement between the two parties. Uh, well, if not for the deed, you wouldn't have been enforcing on the basis of non-monetary defaults uh, or the only defaults before the expiry were non-monetary defaults though, weren't they? That's true. Um, and Bankwest first met with um, Mr Weller and his wife in September 2012 and the deed of forbearance was entered into in January. Again, was that, in your experience, um, expeditious or um, normal? Or how, how would you describe that, that period of time? Uh, it's very difficult to respond on timing. I mean, it, it, um, what were the circumstances? What was the availability? What was the relationship like between the parties? I mean, it, uh, it, um, if the question is related to the deed of forbearance being provided to Mr Weller on the 8th of January when the loan expired on the 10th of January, um, that doesn't seem very... Um, the timing of that's unfortunate. That doesn't seem very, very fair. Uh, can I ask you a couple of questions before we come to Mr Doherty? Um, <coughs> there's evidence from one of your uh, colleagues um, from Bank West, from Bank West, um, Ms. Um, Taylor, Sinead Taylor, which sets out the current uh, the the current standard forms that are used in relation to business lending by uh, by Bank West. Are you familiar with what's used by Bank West as distinct from CBA? Uh, I think familiar would be the wrong description. I mean, I broad. Awareness would be probably as good as I would sort of claim, I think. I see. Um, perhaps I can just take you briefly to um, 
a document, and that is CBA.0517.0052.2021. Now, the first, this is some correspondence that have been written by Bank West to, um, to ASIC. Now, I'm not putting to you that the unfair contract terms provisions would have even applied to Mr Waller at the time, because his um, loan was in excess of the relevant limit. Mm. Um, but one of the issues that was raised by um, Mr Waller's evidence, if one goes to point 0263, was the issue of unilateral variation and the relevant Bank West employee who wrote this letter deals with that there. Um, and are you aware that at least for um, at least for general terms to which those um, provisions apply, there's no more review clauses? I am, yes. Um, and uh, um, and there's also um, amendments that have been made um, to um, the unilateral variation clause 18.21. Um, um, and it's explained now 18.21. I didn't take you to, but you might recall, I think it might be, and I'm not sure Mr. Weller went to it in evidence, but that in, is a clause which entitles the bank to make unilateral variations. Are you familiar with those clauses? In broad terms, yes. yes. Um, And have you had any involvement with, um, with this particular project of um, updating standard form clauses? Um, so in relation to this letter, which I think was to ASIC around yes. unconscionable conduct, I've had no involvement at all in that. Uh, the Carnell um, involvement and the broader um, amendment of the general terms that CBA and Bank West have been through in recent times, I've had involvement in that process. Uh, and. Um, in your own view of, um, in your own um, experience, these the changes in relation to unilateral um, variations, is that something that um, um, has a, a, a positive um, impact on the treatment of customers? Uh, can I answer the question slightly different way? I think unilateral rights to change the terms and pricing, absent any sort of evidence of credit deterioration or other things like that, which is why I like financial covenants, because that's sort of evidence that you can use, I find hard to justify. That's a personal view. Um, I think we've recognised that below three mil, um, but I'm not sure it's particularly different above that. But as I said, that's a personal view. Uh, and, in, and in fact, you might uh, you might say that Mr. Weller's circumstances weren't that significantly different from someone under three million dollars. It was one property, it was one business that he was running. Yet, a limit of three million dollars would have meant that those sort of protections aren't in place for him. But I don't think the unilateral changes were an impact on Mr. Weller. I mean, I think they, that's quite different. Um, I think in Mr. Doherty's case. Um, that might be a factor that you will probably take me to, but in Mr. Weller's case, I don't think they were relevant or used at all. The because, because, can you ex expand your answer? Um, we didn't make any amendments or any changes um, using those, relying on those clauses. The changes that happened were as facilities were renegotiated and renewed. Um, I, I'm not aware with Mr. Weller that we actually triggered a pricing increase or a change to the terms unilaterally relying on those clauses. Thank you. Can we go to, can I ask you some questions now about Mr Doherty? Um, 
you've heard you you were here in the commission. I think you've, you you said you were here when Mr. Doherty gave his evidence this morning. That's right. And in fact, last yesterday evening as well. That's right. Um, obviously, uh, this is a complex case, and um, and we won't be able to deal with all of the issues. Um, uh, that arise, but I'd like you to take you to some aspects of it, if I may. Um, the facility to fund the hotel construction was entered into in, I think there might be some dispute as to the exact dates, but it was either um, 2008, 2009, in any case, before the construction commenced, is that right? Uh, some of the construction may have commenced, some initial work perhaps was funded by um, the company before the loan was drawn down, but fairly close to the start, I think is I correct. Um, and in fact, Bankwest had provided a facility to Mr Doherty beforehand, or at least to Mr Doherty's companies, hadn't it? That's right. Uh, and those facilities were advanced to Mr Doherty's companies before CBA acquired Bankwest, is that right? That's right, I think 2007 they were That's right. advanced. That's um, right. And from your review of the material, there were no obvious concerns in relation to um, the risks that might be involved in the types of development that Mr Doherty's companies were doing at that time? 2007, you're referring to? Yes. Uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, uh, and M Mr um, Doherty's evidence is that he was introduced to Bankwest by um, by a, a Mr Craig from JLL. Did you hear that evidence? I did. Is that a common way in which business is brought to Bankwest or in fact to CBA? Uh, I think um, both um, consumer and business banking brokers are involved and, and I think effectively that gentleman was, ref was performing a broking type, type role. Um, I think there is a specific channel within the bank that, that you know, deals with brokers, so it's not uncommon that that would happen. Um, now, Mr Doherty explained in, in general terms, although we came at the start of his evidence and we return to the issue today, um, the difference between in one line and mixed use valuations. Now, putting aside the specifics of this case, do you agree broadly with what he said about the differences between um, those two methods of valuation? I thought, listening to Mr Doherty yesterday, his description of the differences was uh, as good as it gets, so I think that was... Um, I'm happy to rely on that description. Thank you. Um, uh, and you, no doubt, from your experience, are um, aware of the, the differences, between, the difference between those two forms of valuation? I'm a lot more aware of the differences today than I was a few weeks ago, but... I am aware. Yes. Um, now, do you know? Um, do you know of? No doubt you do know of Knight Frank. Yes. Um, do you, Do you know a Mr. Page who performed two valuations in two thousand and ten? I don't. Um, in your experience, does it matter um, when a valuation is performed by um, by a valuer? Um, who's you know, properly registered and provides the valuation. Is there um, a difference in the, the valuation depending on who um, engages the valuer to do the valuation? Um, I think banks prefer when we instruct valuers. Um, I think... Um, you know, the scope of the valuation is important. Um, I think, you know, the, the, um, the extent of it, the, the, the scope, I think, is, you know, banks have their standard sort of things that they uh, require. I think sometimes clients will get sales valuations, short-form valuations, you know, other types of valuations that may not necessarily be adequate from a bank's perspective. Now, Hadley's and Inner Collins, the combined development, was valued a number of times between 2007 and 2011. There's just, for, for present purpose, I want to focus on two of the valuations. There'd been a valuation of the property which Mr Doherty described as a cheque valuation. 
you recall? I do recall that, that, yes. Um, and in fact, I, mean, I might take you to um, that valuation. It's at PNC5, which is CBA.0001.0319.4. Have, you've obviously seen this um, valuation for the purposes of preparing um, your evidence today. I have. And you recall if one goes to 0.4984, um, you'll recall um, we went to this particular page as a summary with, and I'll ask that the table be blown up if I may. This valuation was done in um, August 2008, and as I understand it, it was done for the purposes of Bank West um, deciding, amongst other factors, on whether or not to um, enter into the, the, the facilities with Mr Doherty. That's correct. Uh, and the, from reading, um, uh, that um, this summary, you'll see that the in one line valuation that was given was $53.5 million. Do you see that? I do. Um, now, if one looks at the there's various um, um, other permutations, if one looks at the Collins Street alone in one line valuation, do you see that that, has 30, that is $39.7 million? I do. Uh, and you'd agree that um, if you look at the gross realisation, the, the final figure, Collins Street gross realisation of lots level eight as residential <coughs> apartments, um, that has a valuation of $49.39 million. I do. I, I, can I help, perhaps, Mr Donnelly? I, I recall a conversation you had with Mr Doherty around this table, and I agree with where you got to on that. So Thank you. 15 Thank plus 49, 74, 75 as a mixed use. I, I think you might find 64.59 million was Sorry, the... 64. That, but um, I agree with that. OK, thank you. Um, and your evidence, is it not is that um, Bank West relied on the in one line valuation for the purposes of um, for the purposes of determining whether or not to fund Mr Doherty's um, uh, facilities? Uh, I don't think that's probably a fair summary of my well, evidence. In your in um, at paragraph, I'm sorry, at paragraph 20 of your statement, you set out um, the valuation, or oh, you've summarised the valuation there um, with the figures that we've just got to and that you've agreed with, $53.5 million and $64.59 million. Yes. Uh, and and I, I might have misled you in this regard. I think I was relying on what you'd said in um, um, an earlier draft. But is it the position, or do you accept that the bank um, relied upon, or did uh, relied upon a higher figure than the in-one-line valuation? Is that right? Um, I think the bank's view about this changed over time, so I'm just reluctant to give you a yes or no answer to that. So I think um, in the credit paper that followed the CBRE thing, I think it's fair to say that Bank West used the multi-use um, valuation um, that um, um, Mr um, Longmuir, I think, who, who was writing that paper, so I think the bank did accept that. Um, that's what he put forward and that, what, that was what was approved. 
Um, I think subsequently, from what I've seen in the files, the bank appeared to change its mind. Can I just return to 2008, though, and we'll come to later, of course, but, and I accept you weren't there, but uh, the use of the mixed use amount um, as at 2008, mm. um, that would be consistent, would it not, with, um, with the evidence of Mr Doherty gave about what Mr Longmuir had told him as well? Well, I'll object to that. Perhaps he could be asked about what Mr Longmire told to him, because there's various different bits that Mr Longmire is alleged to have told to him. Yeah, just uh, be a bit from the question, respect. Mr Donnelly, you might do better, I think, to uh, unpack it or uh, rephrase it. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, you heard Mr Doherty's uh, evidence um, in relation to discussions that he had with um, Mr Longmuir, the, his, his relationship manager in 2008. Do you recall that Mr Doherty gave some evidence about that? I do. And he, um, he said, um, or perhaps if I can go to what um, Mr Doherty says in his statement, which I understand was consistent with what um, what he gave orally, but <coughs> essentially, in essence, it was that he said that Mr Longmuir had said to him that Bankwest had accepted the mixed-use valuation of $64.59 million during the loan approval process. Do you recall the evidence that Mr Doherty gave to that effect? I, that's not what I heard Mr Doherty say. He said, um, in his oral evidence, he, he said... Um, that he said to him, it is what it is, do you recall? I, I recall those words, but I think the relevant comment around Mr Longmuir was Mr Longmuir had said, um, if we didn't use that, we would have to go, he would have to go back to credit, which I think is at odds with what I remember in Mr Doherty's statement, where he said, if we used in one line, the deal would not proceed. So quite different uh, was my take. Um, But is it right to say, am, am I right to say that the, and we can go to the, the relevant um, approval if, if you wish, but that um, approval, at least in 2008, did proceed upon the basis of the multi-use. That's um, true. Thank you. Uh, and is it also right to say that at least when we came to the second valuation that I'd like to deal with, the July 2011 valuation, uh, and you'll recall that's the one that was done by Jones Lang LaSalle, mm. and that was done on an in-one-line basis, wasn't it? So I understand, yes. Uh, and um, is it your evidence that the, that the bank by the time it got to July 2011, took um, a different view as to what was the appropriate valuation of the properties. <coughs> it's not entirely clear to me, Mr Donnelly. I think what I did see from the credit papers was that earlier paper we just talked about, the bank accepted the multi-use uh, valuation methodology. In subsequent ones, it, it does appear that the bank um, wasn't prepared to do that and wanted in one line as the valuation methodology. Um, I don't know why that changed. I, I could perhaps provide some help in the bank's general view about multi-use and how we actually proceed with transactions, if that helps. We, we might come to that, but if I can understand, but you, you accept that if a valuation is done on in, in one line, it leads to... Um, it leads to a, or at least in this case, it leads to a, a, a significant lower valuation, doesn't it? Um, in, in general terms, I'd not agree with that. In specifically in relation to this matter, I think that is true. It's not a general proposition that it automatically flows to be the case, but in this case, I think that is a true statement. Uh, can we just unpack that a little bit? So it's your, so I understand what you say about this particular case, but. Can there be circumstances where an in-one-line valuation can achieve um, a higher figure than a multi-use valuation? Um, 
I'm not a valuation expert, um, but my understanding is yes. I mean, there can be circumstances where in one line is the best um, way of selling something. It may be, um, you know, um, I'm thinking of an example. You could have a, um, um, what's a, a terrace house split in two. So you could have, you know, if you tried to sell them um, individually, um, you know, you may get lower than if you sold them as a combined. So there's an example. And, and a very uh, rough one, where in one line could actually give a higher result. And what I'm trying to explore with you, though, is that, but in, so applying that analysis, though, in this particular case, though, you would accept that uh, a multi-use valuation would lead to a higher value than a in one line valuation. I simply rely on the evidence I've seen that valuations that were undertaken, and there were a lot of them, they seem to indicate that the you know, multiple use valuation was a higher figure than the in one line in this particular matter. And there may be circumstances and akin to the answer you just gave previously where it might be the opposite, hmm. and we can put that to one side, it doesn't arise here, but um, the I, relevant difference that was identified by in the check valuation, that is, that was done by uh, uh, by CBRE by Mr. Grieve in August 2008, resulted in an 11 million dollar or an 11 million dollar higher um, valuation if it was done as a mixed use rather than as an in one line. That's right, isn't it? That's what the valuation said. Yes. Uh, and you're also um, the valuation that was done by JLL, perhaps if I can go to that, um, is, is at PNC 22. And no doubt you've considered this um, uh, this document for the purposes of um, preparing your statement. I have. Now, Mr. Uh, or Jones Lang LaSalle was asked to um, to value the property on an in one line basis. Is that right? probably prefer to go to the instructions to see if that's actually true. I'm not doubting that, but... Yeah, so, um, and in fact, there's quite a number of um, documents, but if one goes to um, uh, the document ending 1990, <coughs> um, that's the appendices, and you jump ahead two pages, you find the letter of instructions and standard terms conditions. And in fact, it might be easiest to do it in chronological order, which means we start from the back. Uh, but 1998 are the actual instructions that were provided on the 18th of March, 2011. Uh, and Mr. Craig, um, if one goes to um, the, uh, the substantive text, you are requested to carry out evaluation on our behalf of the above property in accordance with the following instructions. Now, there's no um, uh, reference, or perhaps I'll take you through, um, through it, but the reports be provide, to be provided, you see how it's there, it says, please provide one original report and one copy for release to the client, do you see that? I'm sorry, where's that? Um, about um, halfway down the page. Uh, yes, I do. Um, but the valuation wasn't given to the client, was it? I think that's correct. So the ba basis of the valuation was described as current unencumbered market value. So if you see just about 0 0.7 of the page. Yes. And it's 
Hadley's Hotel as is, subject to the existing management agreement, and Inner Collins as is and as if complete, and then at the end, and in one line. Do you see that? I do. Now then... Um, uh, I don't want to be pedantic here, but and in one line, does that suggest...? No, we'll have to come to the later correspondence, because I think there was... Um, because the next... If one goes to 1997, this might assist in resolving the query that you raise. So this is some, some months later, and there was evidence that it took some time for the valuation. Let's leave that to one side. But um, Mr Craig said, hi, Nicole, as discussed, um, we will value the property on the following basis as a freehold going concern in one line comprising all elements of both Hadley's and Inner Collins. Do you see that? Yeah. Um, and then... Um, same as, and then number two was same as number one above, but excluding the following components, and there's some components <coughs> set out. Uh, and it then goes on to say, the number two scenario would require strata title being available, and I will ask one of my Melbourne-based colleagues to quote on valuing the elements. Do you see that? I do. And then... Then on the next page, there's a response from Bank West or Ms Tatalia from um, her to Mr Craig. Thank you for your email and time today. Do you see that? I do. Uh, and it says, instead of proceeding with option two, can we discuss a further scenario to include Hadley's Hotel and the conference areas and all commercial areas? Um, and I understand the proposal is for these areas to remain under ACOR management, and then it says, as I understand the in-one-line valuation for the entire complex is now complete, I would be happy to receive this valuation. However, would like to discuss a further fee, quote, time frame and information requirements for an addendum. Do you see that? I do. Now, then... Um, uh, going to 1993. Um, the bottom, Mr Craig indicates before issuing the final report, so might, this is on the 26th of, um, the 26th of July. Um, and it was ultimately signed in July, but I don't think our research had worked out exactly the date, although the valuation was produced as at the 26th of July. Um, there's a reference, to, I wish to confirm the final base of our valuations for the Hadley's Hotel and Inner Collins. And the first is that all elements, um, leaving aside what's in brackets, within, contained within Hadley's and Inner Collins operated as one consolidated concern in one line. Um, as instructed, this valuation will be hypothetically done both subject to the ACOR management agreement and assuming vacant possession. However, we note that subsequent to our original instruction, Mantra has been appointed to operate the Inner Collins development and our valuation does not take this into account. Do you see that? I do. Um, and then two, um, all elements of Hadley's Hotel plus conferencing only elements of Inner Collins operated as one consolidated going concern in one line. Uh, and that would be done subject to ACOR management and assuming vacant possession. So they're the two. The first is sort of the everything in one line yeah. and on the basis that ACOR would manage everything, whereas, and we'll come to this shortly, um, uh, Mr Craig notes but doesn't deal with the fact that Mantra could manage Inner Collins. Mm. Um, and then the response from Nicole... 
um, is, thank you, that's great. Um, I tried calling earlier to obtain verbal confirmation of the value under option two. Can you call me when you're free to confirm? And then if um, one goes to 1992, Mr Craig says, we have been focusing on the Hadley's plus inner Collins conferencing valuation and have not obtained the mantra forecasts. In any event, they would not be a like with like comparison. The ACOR forecasts I have are for HH and IC operated as one asset, whereas the mantra forecast would relate to running inner Collins as a standalone operation, excluding the conferencing components, of course. This would make it another basis of valuation and above that we have been instructed to carry out at this point in time per my email below. You see that? I do. And then the bank says, agree with your comments. Can you advise the valuation of Hadley's only per valuation two as soon as possible? And then the report itself was provided. Now, as you know, um, the evaluation that was um, provided, if one goes to 0.1887, It valued, and perhaps if I can ask it to be um, blown up, there's two market values as if complete. And one sees that the in one line valuation is $55 million. Do you see that? I do. Assuming vacant possession and presumably in answer to the email we've just seen from um, Ms Tartaglia, <coughs> then we have another one which is all of Hadley's and the conferencing areas only, that's $20 million. You see that? I do. Now, the bank was aware at this time that, um, well, Mr Doherty had raised on a number of occasions, I think it might even be fair to say that he was badgering Mr. Mr. Craig, the bank, regularly about the fact that he was concerned that this valuation was going to be performed in one line, wasn't he? I don't think I'd use the term badgering, Mr. Donnelly, but I think he was um, frequently pursuing that view and sharing it. Well, that is a kind of view to describe, and that's probably more accurate. Uh, and he said on, and I won't take you to these um, emails, you refer to them, oh, sorry, um, I won't take you to all of these emails, but if I can just take you to a summary of it, perhaps in Mr Doherty's material at MED 13. And Mr Doherty says there to, um, sorry, on the second page, point two, point oh two oh three. He says, read the valuation. We're not trying to be difficult in any shape or form, but like you, we just want it done as soon as possible and make sure that it is the right valuation. My only concern with Tra Craig doing the valuation is that he can only do it in one line. As he told me, he doesn't do strata title units. If we go with option two, which looks like the most likely scenario, we will then want somebody else to value the strata title units. You see that? Mm -hmm. And he made similar, um, uh, he expressed his concern um, in a number of later emails too, didn't he? I think that's correct, yes. Um, um, and it was Mr Doherty's position that um, the true potential of the property would only be realised on um, a mixed-use development valuation approach, wasn't it? Um, 
I understand that's the case. Perhaps this is a good time to come back to my offer I made previously about explaining how banks think about mixed-use development, because there are some um, permutations of that that are relevant here, I think. Um, yes, and I don't want to stop you from giving relevant evidence. So, so just quickly, so the valuation is one thing, um, and I'm not a valuation expert. It's, you know, we have two or three of the top valuers providing these valuations. For banks doing mixed-use development, though, one of the things um, that we would be very conscious about for apartments, penthouse-type sales, is pre-sales. And in the current market, you know, we generally would require 100% of those pre-sales to be contracted with deposits before we would lend against them. So evaluation is one thing. It doesn't, it's not the same thing as saying that's what the bank would happily lend against. I just wanted to make that distinction. Well, so in, in terms of the multi-use development in this particular case, um, you know, there were vari various permutations, I think, that Mr Doherty um, looked at in terms of penthouses and apartments and, and uh, various other ones. But for us to be comfortable lending against those, we would normally require those, those contracts or those pre-sales to actually be contracted but rather than just a valuation on its own. Uh, not, not to be difficult, and you are explaining it, but you've accepted, though, that in this particular case, and I accept not only is 2008 a long time ago, but so is the relevant time we're talking about now, 2011. But in 2008, you did, however, that is Bank West, you've conceded, accepted the mis mixed-use valuation as a basis upon which that to borrow. That absolutely is true. I guess I'm trying to explain, I think, why the bank shifted to in one line, why there was this divergent sort of change from the bank's perspective through this process. And I think that's part of the explanation, I suspect, behind that. I don't know. I don't have any um, facts or, or uh, around that. But that strikes me as one of the reasons, perhaps, that the bank kept insisting on in one line as being the appropriate basis. You'd accept, though, that at this time we're very close to completion of the project. In fact, the certificate um, of occupancy was issued the month after, wasn't it? Uh, I think that's true, yes. And I think to use your language, if I may, I mean, one might say that uh, a lot of the risk that existed in 2008 has been de-risked by the fact that the, the development is now at an end, isn't it? Well, it's not quite an end, but the risk has diminished significantly. Yes. It has. Um, and Mr Doherty's evidence was that once this valuation was obtained, he was told that it was in breach of the LVR. Do you recall his evidence to that effect? Um, I think that was what he said, yes. And do you accept that the basis for that breach was the JLL val valuation? Um, I can't recall whether we actually called that as a breach specifically in, in relation to this matter. We may well have. I, I can't recall. The valuation itself... Sorry, just to return to that before moving on from that. Sorry, is it your evidence that you're not sure whether or not, Mr... Um, from your review of this material, you're not sure whether or not Mr Doherty was told that there was a breach of the LVR? Is that...? Um, um, I think what I'm saying is I'm not aware we called the breach of LVR in a formal notification. I think Mr Doherty's evidence was around a conversation he had with someone. I'm not disputing that. I'm just unsure in my mind whether we actually issued a, a formal um, letter of, of LVR breach. There, there were letters that were ultimately issued because by then the um, by then uh, the tranche one facilities had expired, so there was a demand for payment that were made, and they didn't refer to LVR. They just required the repayment of the expired facilities. I just wanted to be clear about your question. You asked me whether I was aware of the LVR breach being communicated with Mr Doherty, and I, I, was, I heard his evidence that he was told verbally by someone in Bankwest. I'm not disputing that. I have no basis to dispute that. I was just questioning whether we'd actually formally sent a, a notice of breach. No, I, no, I, I, I wasn't I understand, clear to me. So. Yeah, and I understand your evidence in that regard, and you are right that there was no formal notice on that basis um, in Rather, the, the notices were issued on the basis that um, the, uh, the facilities had expired and required repayment. The valuation... Have you had 
regard to have you considered in the course of preparing your evidence the valuation prepared by Mr Craig in, in detail? Uh, in detail would probably be um, but, more than, than I provided. I've, I've read through it. I think yes. Um, are you able to assist the Commission by explaining why Bankwest at the time didn't use CBRE, who had completed the earlier valuation? I don't know. Um, can you explain um, why Mr Craig didn't deal with um, the, the previous method of valuation? I don't know. Um. <coughs> Now, Mr. Uh, just before you go on, Mr. Dinelli, can I just uh, try to understand this a little better than I am? Uh, at this stage, uh, the uh, facilities have expired. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, the valuation is sought uh, in connection with using that as a very broad. <laughs> Term in connection with discussions about whether there will be an extension or new facility. Is that right? I think that's true, yes. Therefore, what is the, uh, uh, I was going to say the purpose of the valuation, uh, what's the relevant basis of valuation uh, that bears upon uh, whether uh, to extend or renegotiate the facility? I think, Commissioner, there are probably two factors that would be relevant. One is the actual valuation and what is our um, uh, loan to security um, margin. We would be of, um, that would be relevant. I think the other issue is actually helping with uh, forecasted cash flows because as part of the valuation, a valuer will look at what he thinks this asset can generate in terms of cash flows. So I think that's also a relevant piece of information that we would like to use. Because there are, my question's prompted by two probably disconnected uh, observations that may themselves be misplaced. I see the email chain passing between bank and valuer about basis of valuation. Do I find in that set of communications uh, any <coughs> clear articulation uh, of what uh, the bank is asking the valuer uh, to do? Uh, I think it's confusing to me when I read the scope. I think in the subsequent emails, it's um, the banks toing and froing in one line, plus have a look at these other sort of permutations. I think um, when I think about the timing of this, you know, the facility has expired. It's not as though we're looking for the valuation to provide us with some trigger, um, you know, in a LVR covenant breach. That's not. Uh, so the, from the bank's perspective, it really wants the most accurate valuation, I think. And the second and, uh, as I say, probably disconnected thought is, what's the customer being told uh, about uh, the valuation process and what uh, the bank is looking for the valuation to uh, uh, inform them about? My understanding, Commissioner, in this particular case is um, Mr Doherty was concerned about exactly what the bank was asking for in terms of in one line rather than mixed use and he was very um, 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 open, I think, in his views about the basis that the valuation he should He had take. a view and he made it quite plain to very the bank clear. what that view was. And so there was, and there was open discussion around that. I guess at the end of the day, I sort of look at this issue and it sort of seems a little moot to me because I'm not sure at the end of the day it was actually relevant to the outcome here. And I, I don't know whether the valuation should have been in one line or mixed use. Uh, 
I, I, I'm not qualified to respond to that. What I do seem to see from my review is it actually didn't have any bearing on the outcome. You'll need to explain that more to me than uh, uh, you have so far, I think. Um, perhaps if I could try and do it very briefly, and uh, I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm not successful. Um, well, there's a chance at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, the facility had expired. Um, why didn't we renew the facility? Um, and there's some evidence I think we've, we've brought to that point. The high LVR was certainly one of those things. The LVR breach was just indicative of high LVR. It wasn't in itself the reason that we didn't renew. It was concern about um, um, the creditors, the time that would take to get this done, um, you know, where this was heading. The information we were getting from the Doherty Group, there was a lot of concerns, I think, about we just didn't feel we had a good understanding of the borrower. and. These issues, the credit deterioration that we were seeing, that um, we didn't want to renew the facility. So the LVR in itself was a factor, um, it was relevant, but it wasn't the reason. It wasn't because of whether the valuation was 75 or 65 that was determining whether we were going to extend this loan. I think the other factors were more important in this particular case from what I've seen from the file review. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Can I explore just two further issues? Um, just in relation to that, you you knew that there was a certificate of occupancy in August two thousand um, and eleven, don't you? Uh, yes. Um, and you've heard Mr. Doherty's evidence that he was waiting on. Um, the three million dollars that would be paid on execution of a management agreement by Mantra. I heard that, yes. Um, and the bank was aware, was it not, that Mr. Doherty was in financial difficulty or his group of companies? I think that's true, yes. And that he owed money to the ATO? Yes. Um, and that he required those funds to finalise the, the hotel so that it would be ready to, um, um, so that Mantra could um, commence operation? I heard the evidence, yes. And it was Bank West's position that it wasn't willing to um, sign the management agreement? Um, so I think you... The tripartite agreement, I should say, I'm sorry. Is this the non-disturbance right. agreement? Uh, that's correct. We weren't, Bank West weren't prepared to sign it. And you've heard Mr Doherty's evidence that if that $3 million had a flow, that would have been sufficient to... Um, discharge um, his debt to the ATO. I did do that, yes. Uh, and uh, and various other debts, such that the um, such that the Inner Collins could have commenced operation under the Mantra name. I heard that evidence, yes. Um, and the refusal of Bank West to sign that um, agreement had the effect that um, that wasn't able to to happen. Um, well, there's a long sort of uh, build-up of subsequent events. I think the refusal of Bank West to uh, uh, sign that non-disturbance agreement um, stopped the Mantra agreement from being signed. I think that is a fair comment. Um, can I touch on why we would have refused to sign that non-disturbance agreement? Of course. Um, for a secured creditor, uh, effectively postponing our rights to the operator of the hotel, um, the, is what was required under a non-disturbance agreement. Basically means we can't, if we were to sell that asset, we can only sell it to the holder of that, um, who has the benefit of that non-disturbance agreement. And that's something we're very loath to do. That's, that creates one buyer, you know, effectively. And that um, goes to the value of the security. You know, if we got a valuation on the basis of um, only one potential purchaser, um, you know, that would have a significant impact on valuation. So that's something that we're very loath to agree to, uh, not just in this case, but as a broad general um, comment on um, hotel-type non-disturbance agreements. Excuse me, just for a moment. 
Uh, excuse me, sorry, Mr. Clark. I'm happy to stop any time you would like, Mr. <laughs> I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, <laughs> um, can I deal with briefly um, going back in time? Um, as a result of Project Magellan, Mr. Doherty's, uh, Mr. Doherty's uh, file was listed as um, double red, wasn't it? That's correct. Um, and would it be fair to say that Project Magellan saw a significant shift in the attitude of the bank to risk generally and also specifically in relation to Mr Doherty? Uh, I wouldn't agree with that comment. I don't think Project Magellan um, um, resulted in any significant shift in risk. I think Project Magellan was a result of a perception or a concern that the risk had already shifted in the, in the book that was being looked at. I mean, I didn't, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. No, no then I said specifically, it resulted, it did it not, in, um, in ultimately the appointment of um, <coughs> investigative accountants? Um, you will get much more fruitful evidence on Magellan, I suspect, from subsequent witnesses. But my broad understanding, I think there are a thousand plus files reviewed in Project Magellan, which was, um, I don't know, 10 or 20 per cent of the Bank West portfolio. So it wasn't the entire <coughs> portfolio, but there was a significant material part was reviewed. Um, <coughs> and just finally, um, can I just go back to the period in about August 2011? Um, the hotel obviously didn't operate during that period until um, January 2012. I think May 2012. I think the hotel. I see. Well, the receivers were appointed in um, were appointed in in January. I think that's true. Yes. Um, and in fact, the receivers sought some further funding from um, Bankwest um, um, soon after their appointment? Yeah, I think the receiver overdraft got up to almost $4 million, I think. Um, uh, and, and in fact, ultimately, the receivers appointed um, ACOR to operate um, the inner Collins, and it uh, opened in 2012, is that right? April 2012? Um, so I'm not aware who they appointed um, to manage it, but certainly May 12 is my understanding of when it opened. Um, and it operated for um, for about a year before it was sold? Um, I think there was a endeavour to bed in the operations, I guess, before the sale process uh, commenced. Uh, and ultimately the... Um, and ultimately the... Um, and this Commissioner answers a question that you put previously in your um, in your evidence, you set out um, what the property sold for. You're not going to ask me for the sum of those, are you? Uh, no. Um, um, they are in my, did... my they are in my statement. Thank um, you, and it and it's um, it's my way of assisting the commissioner through you, Mr. Clark. Um, if you go to paragraph 85, I should apologise. We should have totaled them. I think. No, that's fine. So perhaps if I can ask the paragraph 85 to be put up on the screen of Mr uh, Clark's statement. Uh, and the relevant property sold in September 2013, Hadley's for $8.325 million and in a Collins for $24.9 million. Is that right? That's right. Ultimately, Bank West suffered a, significant, a very significant loss on this file, didn't it? Uh, we did, yes. Um, and what was that loss? Uh, something in the order of $38 million, I think. $38 million. Um, no further questions. Yes, thank you, Mr Hodge. Mr Stapleton, do you say you have... You, if you have no questions, we needn't get to any question of leave, need we? <laughs> Ms Collins. Um, I have no re-examination, Commissioner. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, just before you leave the box, uh, Mr. Clark, a question of more general application, uh, take it away from these two particular case studies. Um, a facility comes to its end, uh, the bank for uh, whatever reason decides it does not wish to renew that facility or negotiate a new term uh, with the customer. You're able to identify what would be important considerations which might affect whether refinancing that debt would be realistic? So two things jump to my mind to respond to that question, Commissioner. Um, one is a return question. So um, is the pricing on the facility um, or, or the, the lending transaction for the risk involved and the tenor the client wants is that providing an acceptable return to the bank? So it may be that, um, for whatever reason, um, it's suddenly less attractive commercially to that uh, current um, lender. Um, whether that's the case for every other lender or whether it would able to easily refinance is a, is a question, I think. But that would be one reason why lenders would, would decide they didn't want to um, roll out. You know, competition in that particular industry or sector may be intense and therefore they weren't able to get the returns they wanted. Their cost structure may be out of line, a whole host of reasons, but returns could be one. The second one, I guess, is credit deterioration. So if a lender was of a view that the credit had deteriorated or was going to deteriorate in the future and that therefore they didn't want to uh, continue with that client, um, that would also be a factor. The third one that jumped to mind as I was answering the, articulating the first two responses was the relationship. So it may be that the relationship with the client sometimes breaks down and, and it may be the trust and the um, understanding between the bank and the client is not um, from either side, not where it should be, and so the bank may decide to, to let it go at that stage. Yes. Does anybody have anything arising out of that exchange? No? Thank you very much. You may step down and you are excused.